whatever whatever that means. Actually, probably you're probably not the creative guy. I'm sure there are. Actually, no. I have uh, in guys. the last couple of years, I've passed the baton, which is really nice and really difficult. I would imagine. Yeah, they do get louder. Yeah, I saw the volume button over here. Okay. Do you have a volume? Yeah. What is there? There's a volume knob for you down there if you want to adjust. There's it. two that should in and out of the knob, right? Where you're plugged in. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, check our. We just had an announcement on the news. The medium house income is sixty-one thousand, the highest ever since they've been keeping track of that. Well, it's good. People can afford to buy houses. How about that truck? Okay. All right, let's uh, check the mics. If they don't work, we can all go to the bar and forget this. <laughs> that will be bringing down the media, though, for the bar. <laughs> check, check. One, two, three. Check, check. Testing. One, two, three. Check, check. One, two, three, four, five, six. Check, check. One, two, three, four, five, six. Very good. All right. Just a. Uh, What's that? I had my headphone like. The 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 brick line on our website, the hitting your head with the brick. It's not a tagline. We don't. You can tell we don't rattle it off very often. <laughs> I think it was on uh, LinkedIn. It was probably on LinkedIn. Yeah, it was more I of a descriptor. It's Twitter. It's it's in there it's as a social media. Stuff. It's in there as a descriptor and kind of a what's our personality more so than. A tagline. Okay. We don't, we don't have and, a tagline. I'm sorry. What was it then? The the brick line. The brick meets the forehead line. That you wrote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's just stuff that came out of conversation. Like a brick to the forehead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But yeah. It's a, it's a very nice visual of. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that kind of hurts. <laughs> Which I think that would. Yeah. Most bricks. sorts. Um, we do, uh, we work nationally, we work locally, um, tourism, work in um, B2B businesses, um, national retail, um, and just about all of it. Um, also do a lot of nonprofit work in town too. Um, our core, I mean, we can kind of get to it, but our, our other industry, in the past, agencies in our business would always pick an industry to work in. I'm a retailer, I'm a tourism. Right. Our core has really evolved to people who just need help telling their story. Um, we find that most, whether it's tourism, nonprofit, retail, uh, most brands that come to us, they do that because they realize that their story is not any different than anyone else's in their in their competitive setting. And, and then they change. don't even know what their story is or how to tell yeah. it. I would imagine that. Yeah, we break. I see that a lot. Yeah. We had a Fortune 100 company yeah. come to us um, out of Nashville. And that was their problem. We work with local nonprofits. We work with BSP locally. We work. We just rebranded Old Sacramento. Um, in the process of that's Sacramento. right. I saw that. Yeah, in the process of working with Visit Sacramento, and, and they're all looking for that same. Even if they don't know it, they're all looking for what's that story, so uh, that we can own. So, well, it's not. That's really not different than when you talk to a business person and see if you know what's your why. Right? That's exactly so right. What's exactly the story, right. What's the, what's yeah. the story yeah. for your and, and if you use it that, because that's the popular thing with these sure. days is the why, and people are like, oh, I get it, I understand the why. So what is your why? I have uh. no idea. It's like, okay, you've been in business for 30 years, and you don't know why? Like, well, to it's make money? Yeah. yeah, I got that part, I got that part. But really, why do you do what you do? And it's like, and if you don't know, 
then the person sitting next to you doesn't know, and the person yeah. sitting around the conference table, exactly. no, and everybody's why is a little bit fuzzy and unclear, yeah. or a lot of it fuzzy. And at the end of the day, now how do you expect your customer to yeah. respond? Yeah. The, the answer is, they don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's where most companies live. Yeah. It's just kind of like, we just, we do our bills payable, we, we put payroll, and month to month to month, and year after year, and then 30 years later, it's like, who are you guys? no idea how can you do that yeah so Jerry will give me signals okay. as we get closer to the commercial breaks so how many minutes are left so that's when I flash you guys fingers okay that's great two three two three we actually had a client you mentioned the, the, the why we had a client about six months ago tell us how long have you guys been doing this we said oh, decades and but this brand process that we do is uh, now eight years old he's like you should sue Simon Sinek because he stole your idea because he in his book. <laughs> was that an attorney? It was not. Bad, bad advice. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Numbers on Money 105.5. This is your host, Mark Bellows. I'm a tax principal with Clifton Larson Allen. CLA is a national CPA firm, offices throughout the U.S., and our office is in Roseville. Uh, it is uh, September 12th, and so we are deep in the middle of, or the, towards the end of our latest tax season. September 15th is the due date for uh, businesses that extended back in March and April, and then October 15th is the due date uh, for extended individual tax turns. So, uh, Busy now. We've got uh, yeah. My guest is raising his hand because he's extended. I am as well. So I've got till about October fifteenth to get that done. Probably that's when I'll get it done. Uh, I've also uh, we've got CLA does a series of webinars uh, introducing or explaining I should say to people the new tax law that came out, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that was signed last December. And so um, you can find out about the webinar series at claconnect.com and you can see. Uh, series and find out what the next ones are. There's one today, there's one coming up uh, next week and all that. And I'm actually doing one of those webinars and so I'm, I'm busy working on that as well. So lots going on right now. It's a good time of uh, year to be uh, to be here and busy and all that. And so uh, if you want to get a hold of me, my number is 906-784-7800, mark.bellows at clnconnect.com. You can email me and uh, be happy to talk to you, answer any questions with all, with all uh, is on your mind. Let me know. I have a couple guests today. I want to thank Matt Colbert, David Flanagan of Misfit Agency for joining me. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going today? Hey, it's a great day. It's a beautiful morning. Uh, good, good. So I've got on uh, my right is David, and then on his right is Matt. I get my directions <laughs> correct. <laughs> so well, I don't know. Our listeners will be difficult for them to hear the difference, perhaps, but they'll pick up on what we're talking about. So maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about what uh, your roles are in the company and and, what, what, and then again, also, what Misfit does. Matt's role is to run the company. My role is to drive Matt crazy. I, I, that sounds about right, actually. That's your why. That's what we're talking about. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the why. That's the why. Yeah. Okay, why so. do you do what you do? Because I like to drive Matt crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to put up with it. So there we go. Uh, yeah, Matt and I started uh, a while back, and, and I handle the creative side of the production, and, and uh, Matt handles the strategy and, uh, and the business. Right. And then we have a third partner who's not with us today, and her name is Carol Gleason, and she handles all of our media strategy and media implementation for our clients. So what is it the firm is called? Is it called Misfit? Misfit Agency? I think the website is Misfit, or Agency Misfit, sorry, agencymisfit.com. Like you just go by Misfit. It's interesting because in the land of, in the land of choosing URLs, nothing <laughs> is available. No, I know. So by default, we had to come up with something that went with Misfit that wasn't already taken, and it became agencymisfit.com. And um, so over the years, people just call it Agency Misfit, Misfit Agency, 
but really the name is Misfit. Misfit, okay. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, it's funny, and, and over the years what's been, you know, uh, probably the biggest blessing with that name is we have clients come up to us and say, you know, I I want to be a Misfit. I, I think, or, or they say better yet, I, I think I'm a Misfit. Well, can you help me figure that out? Well, it's funny because when we first when we first started uh, playing around with this, we were like, we're, we want to name it Misfit. And it's like, well, doesn't that mean by default it doesn't fit? <laughs> and won't clients or potential clients think, you know, Misfit? Is, yeah. You guys are broken. Like, oh, yeah, we're very broken. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So, but so no, it's, it's turned out to be one of the, the best things because people just love it. People yeah. like to talk about it. They want to know the What's behind all that? Right, right. It's been a good. Day. Yeah. So you guys are a marketing and advertising agency. Is that a good description, or, or is that not enough? I was going to say marketing and advertising has uh, has a it's kind of a dirty word, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we specialize in branding. And right. Branding okay. is also a dirty word, or it's, okay. it's it's a buzzword that people think they know what branding is, and oh, you do logos and brochures, right? Well, I suppose, uh, but yeah, we, we really dig deep when it comes to branding. Yeah, yeah. From, a, from a marketing and advertising agency standpoint, usually the reason that's a dirty phrase for us is that it usually focuses on the, the what we do, right? The, sure, we make television commercials and videos and radio <coughs> spots and print ads and logos and all those creative assets. Right. And obviously, we're very pr proud of our creative work, but really, they're just pretty pictures without understanding what the client's story is, and that's where the brand comes in. So with our clients, while we do and produce all that creative work and help people engage through media, it starts with the story and the brand. So you, you help your clients tell their story. Is that fair? Yeah, help tell them and, and help identify it, help okay. provide a sense of So taking a step back and staring with it, yeah. Because nine times out of 10, <laughs> 10 times out of 10, you sit down at the table and you say, so tell me about yourself. Uh, or everybody's got a different story and there's just a there's just a confusion around the table as to you know you talked about the why or the who or the what is uh, people just don't have clarity even if they've been in business for 30 40 50 years they just it's just it's like a veneer that builds over the years sure. until at the end of the day there's no clue who you are yeah and I would say they, they often think they know or, or they think hey we were a tennis shoe company so yeah. that's what we, we do. do we make tennis shoes and talk about how great our shoelaces are and how great are the soles of our shoes. That's what we do, right? I'm going to write that down. Do you like thinking you said? Yeah. That's, that's good. <laughs> and, and they realize wow. that, that they sound no different than anyone else in their category, right. and that's where we step in. So you can help them figure out what they're, what differentiates them from And that's the word, others. differentiate. And, and honestly, so many people <clears throat> in a category or whatever, um, they know they're different, but they don't know how. Like Matt said, we make shoelaces or we make tennis shoes, and so do all our competitors. It's like so. Honestly, we're not all that different, yeah. and and that's just not true. Yeah, most most brands, most businesses today, they they, they speak about themselves um, unintentionally as if they're a commodity, and that's a horrible place to be yeah. in a business. Oh, yeah. You know, they know in their gut there's something that makes them different. They just have a really hard time articulating that, and that's really where we help. You know, brands identify. Number one, now how can you sound different than your competition and sound unique? But how can you do so in a way that's authentic to who you are, what makes you special? And that's been you know, our, our niche for since we started Misfit from day one. The flip side of that is is someone who's got, you don't understand our business, our organization is so complex. We have so many different divisions, so many different departments, so many different product lines. How in the world are you going to build a brand around that? And you know, you talk to a law firm and you talk to a shoe company or whatever, and they both have the exact same problem. We have so, it's so complex around here. It's like, I know, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting to uh, talk with people. I talk to clients and prospects all the time, and people oftentimes think their particular business is very unique, very different than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And there is some truth to that, right? I mean, there's something that, like, as you guys are saying, there's something that sets them apart. So. Because it's, you guys are helping them find what that is, right? Yeah, and so often it's not. It has, and I, and I hate saying this word. I love saying it. Uh, it has <laughs> not, It has absolutely nothing to do with the business that they're in, the product or the service that they provide. It's something way deeper than that. 
All right, well, we're talking with Matt Colbert and David Flanagan of Misfit. Well, you're listening to Beyond the Numbers. We'll be right back. How'd that go? Great. Looks like Jerry's got the heat up a little bit. <laughs> come on, sing it. No. Come on, come on. When I was a kid, well, I, I used to love, I still do love to be one of them. When I was a kid, the funniest thing was to, like everyone in the 80s, wear glasses, dark glasses, and just kind of do that. Do this yeah. thing. And so when I, whenever I hear that song, I'm just taken back to, to that. To that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me. <laughs> We're on the Facebook Live. Don't, don't tell me. You guys ever watch um, this guy does the car karaoke a comedian from England? I forget his name. The answer is oh, yes. I've seen it. James Gordon. Yeah, Gordon. Yeah, that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. 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 I've funny. watched a few, but I think he had like Stevie Wonder. I saw he a snippet the other day. I suppose it was like really. He did. I, I I don't watch it very often. Did you see that one? I did see. He gave Stevie the keys at one point and said, "You drive." <laughs> awesome. And we're back. You listen to Beyond the Numbers on my 105.5. Mark Bellows here, your host of the show, a weekly business talk show where we talk with uh, various guests about uh, their business. And then we kind of go, we don't just talk numbers, we go beyond the numbers, hence the name. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, 916-784-7800 or mark.bellows at claconnect.com. I'd be happy to talk to you about any of your tax or accounting or assurance or whatever type of business type needs you have. So today we're talking with Matt Colbert and David Flanagan of Misfit, and uh, Matt, maybe you can go a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into David's background, and then bring it together with how you guys got together and formed Misfit. Sure. I um, I really had no intention of ever being in marketing. Um, when I, <laughs> in fact, I, when I, I was- still think about I, it. <laughs> I, I do. Oh, oh. I, uh, my kids like to remind me um, of my failures, and they constantly remind me that I that I intended to be a, a doctor. Kids are great. Aren't they? they are, yeah. So <laughs> I, I actually spent the first half of my life convinced I would be a doctor, and then um, flunked out of pre med. And so marketing sounded a lot easier. <laughs> and so um, I started my marketing career actually in the late '90s um, with the Sacramento Kings, and was just in the right place at the right time. Um, they on court obviously became very successful yeah. uh, right around that time, and that brought a lot of national brands uh, here to Sacramento, Southwest Airlines, and Budweiser and Pepsi, and it exposed me to a to a world of marketing at a level that, um, you know, I thought I knew everything, um, but um, I didn't at 23 years old. But it gave me a huge yeah, opportunity. Yeah. And Took him uh, until he was 24. <laughs> yeah, and then he knew everything. And and that's how I got into marketing, and and since then. Um, I bounced around a, a bit and met David along the way, and then in 2011 um, started Misfit with David and Carol. And so I've uh, um, I've been around Sacramento, born and raised, born and raised boy, um, been around forever, and uh, <laughs> um, I just always um, uh, been in business for myself. It just happened that way, and and uh, so I had a business uh, here. Oh, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? <laughs> and, uh, Crocker Flanagan. And uh, it became wildly successful, and so much so that we just didn't know what to do with it. It was like a train was going to fall off the tracks. It was right. going so fast. We sold it, and um, in selling it, I met Matt. So Matt was one of the guys that came up uh, the valley and, and uh, purchased uh, the agency. And we just became really good friends, and uh, we just thought alike. And, and because we thought alike, I thought he was brilliant. <laughs> I am actually. Yeah. And so that just, and, and, and that agency uh, went sideways. Uh, and so we just kind of bonked our heads together and uh, let's do it again. So, so the agency went sideways after the purchase? It, it, it actually, um, neither of us, I wasn't an owner of the business. Um, someone I worked for purchased Crocker Plan again. And, um, and right around that time, the economy you know, hit in right. 2008, 2009, right. and, and, and so that company struggled. Um, and uh, it still exists, it still continues to go on. Um, David mentioned that we just 
saw life through the same filter, both professionally and personally, and what really matters, I think, in life and with clients. And, you know, quite honestly, we found ourselves in that agency, helping that agency be very successful, bringing on national clients, but because of the size of the agency, we, um, we didn't get to do the work with clients, mm. and, and that felt very, um, you know, uh, hollow. And disingenuous. And disingenuous, and so <clears throat> we saw the opportunity um, to take a step away, let that company continue to do what it does, and it still exists, um, and for us to create something more intimate and, and frankly, more powerful um, at Misfit, and that's, we've been very blessed. In it's way. interesting because uh, when I fulfilled my quote-unquote contractual obligation with the, the agency that, that bought ours, um, uh, after I was done with that, I was just like, I was just done. It, was just, it got too big, too fast, too wild, and, and, um, and I lost touch with a lot of it, including my soul. Um, so I got a little office down on the down on the river there by Crawdads. That was a mistake. Um, <laughs> well, I say it was a mistake. Did you become a regular Crawdads? <laughs> it was the it was the boats that got me. <laughs> so I had this window that looked out on the river, and um, I had a very relaxed lifestyle, um, looking at all these boats. I had to buy a boat. Which they, they, What'd you get? Yeah, and, and and Matt comes along, knocking on my door, and he's like, David, David, let's let's build another agency. Come on, like, David. Get thee behind me, Sydney. No, yeah, I was just like, no, no, I've been there. I don't want to do that again. He's like, well, what if we, what if we built something smaller, more intimate? Okay, that's interesting to me. So that was, that's the goal with, with Misfit is to not grow a large uh, kingdom, but uh, a much smaller, intimate company. That is the. Does your, the prior firm still have the, the name Parker Funds, or did they just rename it? No, it's names? it's changed names a few okay. different times um, so for a variety of reasons. Confusion. Oh yeah, <laughs> people are always like, "What? What happened to that guy?" Yeah, no, no, that that no, there's no connection there whatsoever. So, um, you guys came together and you started Misfit, and so, what was your first? I don't know, was it gig? What was your first client? <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. You know, um, I was say Drexel. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think there were a couple. Okay. There were a couple clients early on. Um, whether they were the literally the first, you know. At, Probably not, but there were a couple of clients early on that just helped us build a business. Um, one of them um, was on the media side, Papa Murphy's, uh, okay. here in Sacramento Market. Um, did all their media and, and buying and strategy and all that. And then um, Drexel University, um, uh, Dr. Sandy Kirschman, who is now moved in, in Atlanta, but I know is a strong or Paris or Paris wherever or, yeah. she is. She's an amazing woman, and um, uh, Drexel nationally has obviously decided to pull everything back to main right. campus yeah. but that was really kind of our first one of our first special clients here in sacramento and you know i think we owe a, a debt of gratitude to sandy and, and that team to right. give us a chance yeah so um what types of businesses or, or organizations did you guys start or i think obviously start with drexel and, and public Murphy school what have you kind of focused on anything in particular, or are there certain types of uh, ones you work with more than others? So we, um, we it's funny, in our previous agency that we mentioned earlier, we took a very category specific approach. So we work just with retail or just with government. Um, with Misfit, we really intentionally done just the opposite. Um, we just want to work with clients that we can help um, in a genuine way and be open and honest with. And that has led us to relationships with clients ranging from VSP, to visit Sacramento, to in the nonprofit space, Sierra Health Foundation and Lilliput and St. John's, all the way to national retailers like Dollar General, which has more locations in the U.S. than Starbucks, believe it or not. That's wild. Um, over fifteen thousand, I believe. So, um, but there are there many here? There's not too many in California. You see in other parts of the country. Yeah, really heavy in on the East Coast. East Coast, Texas, yeah, Florida. But moving this way. They are. So, are they a competitor to Walmart? They are. Um, they or certainly are a different space. No, they are a competitor. Um, it's a it's a different business model. In fact, when we came to them, they um, they they came to us actually asking us to help them develop some signage. And our, our we told them, "Look, your problem isn't signage. Your problem is." <laughs> we looked at their messaging and very quickly told them, "You're trying to be your problem Walmart. is you don't sell coffee." That's right. Well, <laughs> their their problem is they were saying the exact same thing Walmart is saying and trying to beat Walmart in its own game, and that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So we help them with their brand, and they're doing much better now. And moving west. <laughs> and moving west. And pretty soon they'll have one on every corner. There you go. <laughs> Just like Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've seen them around, but is there, there are some in California, right? Oh, yeah. Is there one in Auburn? It might be good. Or Colfax, I mean, it might be good. Yeah, okay. yeah. Typically low, low income um, okay. pockets, about 300 in California currently, I believe. Yeah, I saw a picture of someone at one getting ready for the hurricane that's coming up. So a person who gets food or something. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, so um, let's see. Uh, what, maybe walk us through the process, if you would, you guys do. If someone, like, someone comes to you and what do they say? They say, we need to, yeah. Yeah. What, what prompts someone to come to you more often? Well, I'll, you I'll, I'll talk about, uh, uh, Matt mentioned uh, St. John's, uh, locally here, St. John's program for real change. Used to be uh, St. John's shelter for women and children. Okay. Very high profile people know that brand pretty well. And uh, they came to us, oh, I don't know, <laughs> four years ago. And Michelle Steve uh, said, uh, we, it's, our, our, our logo is so outdated. <laughs> We really need help with the logo. And I think that's where a lot of people start, is that the logo seems to be this mm -hmm. most prominent outward facing symbol of their brand. Okay. And so what she was really saying was way, again, deeper than we need a new logo. Because I, I looked at it, I was like, yeah, you really do need a new <laughs> logo. That thing hurts. <laughs> um, but more than that, let's take a look at, you know, we talked about the why and the, and the who. Let's take a look at the organization and find out where you're sitting with your brand. And it didn't take but two seconds to talk to her, talk to the board of directors, and find out that everybody was just about as confused as to the who, the why, the what with that organization. Long story short, before we even touched the logo, which is now a beautiful red door, um, before we did that, we dug deep and it was really was fun and scary to stand in front of the board of directors and say, so St. John's Shelter for Women and Children has nothing to do with women and children. <laughs> <laughs> and have them look at you like, crucified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who are these guys? Yeah. Crazy man. Crazy. No. Yeah, no, it was like, oh, what do you mean it has nothing to do with women and children? Of course it has something to do with, it has everything to do with women and children. And the idea is that not from a brand standpoint, standpoint. From a brand standpoint, St. John's was all about personal change. It's like drawing a line in the sand. This is the way I used to live my life. I'm not going to live that way anymore. It's time to change. And so, long story short, it became St. John's program for real change. Do they serve women and children? Absolutely. Right. Day in and day out. But the real brunt of the matter is change. Real change. So. And you got there by discussions with <laughs> board with keepers, uh, people in the business and that sort of thing. To see yeah, they did. it's, it's not a one-man band for sure, and it's not yeah. that we uh, at Misfit we don't go away and hide in the closet and come back. Ah, it's it's a much it more <laughs> you know, like it or not. It's a much more um, process oriented. There's people around the table, people who are invested in the company, the organization, the boards of directors, things like that. Yeah, I would say too. Our job is to, in any case, whether it's Dollar General or St. John's or any or VSP anywhere. Our job is to work with internal stakeholders at all levels to not create a new brand per se, but in the case of St. John's, for example, um, our job is to uncover the brand that's already there. The truth of the matter is that sense of real change, they already knew it. It was already in their, in their, in their heart and their soul. But over the years, just like every other business, Dollar General, VSP, even tourism destinations, visit Sacramento, whatever, so many storylines get added onto that that simple brand. That, yeah, that our job is to often chip away, so that we can uncover what is that brand that's really there. In the case of St. John's, it was real change. And when you uncover that, everyone in the organization, marketing marketers or non-marketers, the light bulb goes on. Yeah. And they say, Call it the light bulb "That's moment. it. Yes, that's what I've <coughs> always felt. Now let's do something with it. Now let's use that to affect the logo." the website and get to the creative tools that most marketing and advertising agencies are known for. Okay, so, so getting people to that, that real, what it is they do. And, I, and it's interesting that you mentioned that when you guys got there, when they got there, they said, oh, yes, yeah. that is what we do. We yeah. just hadn't. And we love that moment. It's, it's we, we coined it the light bulb moment because we saw it once, we saw it twice, 
three times and then over and over it's like it's a level. it's a you can actually see it in people's faces like that, that oh, i see it okay. and it's so simple so stupidly simple it's like i just never thought about it before right right well thanks again i'm talking with uh matt and david of uh, misfit agency here in town we are going to take a break we'll be right back listen down the numbers very good Time to go grab another cup of coffee. You do, absolutely. Oops. Yeah, we probably have three minutes. We need time to get two cups of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We, um, in our industry, the kind of the common one of the common ways that agencies kind of judge each other is kind of creative output. And so there's local awards called the Addy yeah. Awards and yep. things like that. Yes. And over the years, this past year, for example, you know, I think past, since we've started, we've won more of those awards than anyone, um, which is great. Came late to the party. Oh, is it all gone? <laughs> yeah. It's but, all right. But. Do you want to talk about that on there? Um, I, I, I think we yeah, we can, but but I don't. It's it's not really where we talk about a whole lot. What's that? Addies. We're talking about Addies. Oh, you know, yeah. kind of in our industry, that's that's how you judge each other. And so, how many Addies or how many awards or where are you? And it's not just Addies; it's others. And we, this little small agency in Misfit, has won more than anyone since we started. But we hardly ever talk about it, and it's not because it's not where it really matters to us. The creative part is easy. It's the how did you get there? Right. Mm -hmm. um, how do you help St. John's? Yeah, and does it, does it work? Does and it did it work? Needle? Yeah, and, and is it something? Although I do like the awards. Well, the awards are great, <laughs> but but like in the case of St. John's or VSP or anyone in between, is man, is it just a marketing brand or is it a brand that transforms an organization? I mean, you get St. John's. They they then go and paint the red doors on things. They not that's that's a, that's a, that's a nice place to go. Is is and we'll tell. <clears throat> potential clients this and clients is that if you're going to take the time, the energy, and the money to rebuild your brand or discover your brand, and then you don't do anything with it, don't do it. Don't. It's not worth the time and the money to. It's fun and it's sexy and it's it's wow and it reinvigorates yeah. an organization. And then you do nothing with it. It's like, yeah, and a lot of people unfortunately do that. It's like buying the new car. It's really great for the first couple months, and then you don't wash it. And I'm actually speaking in my car. Yeah. You know, you don't wash it, you don't take care of it, quick. and it's in the drive. Yeah, yeah. quick quest. So it makes it easy. Yeah. And you know, and I, you know, you know, we see that in business. Yeah, it's not, it's not uncommon. You go through strategic planning and say, "How do you do that?" And then they kind of fall back on the old habits, right? Yeah. Because old it's habits. Easy and it's, yeah, it's less comfortable. It's more comfortable to fall back on the old. It's, less comfortable to make change sure. differently. So. Well, and I think it's not just about don't, as a business, to, to rebrand, to you know, put the effort in and, and see it through, but it's also about being intentional about developing a brand that isn't your marketing team's brand. We see that all the time. It's, it's, it's oh, here's a brand, but it's going to be pigeonholed in the marketing department, and they're going to run a campaign. Meanwhile, HR, we have a healthcare client with 15,000 employees, sorry, 14,000 employees. What about them? How do we develop, what if we develop a brand that rallied all of them around it too? Right. Right? Oh, well now we see that. That's when you, that's when you're onto something. Good morning, everyone. You're back to Beyond the Numbers on Money 1055. This is your host, Mark Bellows. I'm a tax principal with Clifton Larson Allen. CLA is a national CPA firm with offices throughout the U.S. I'm in the Roseville office. Uh, you can get a hold of me at 916-784-7800 or mark.bellows at claconnect.com. I work with manufacturers and distributors, real estate investors and developers, and contractors, tax planning, tax strategy, tax compliance, which is what I'm busy at but also some tax strategy because I'm <clears throat> trying to figure stuff out by year end in terms of uh, implementing a new tax law. So busy time, you know, once again, every tax law is always the, you know, the full employment act for accountants and this one's been no different. So there's 
plenty of us busy. Uh, today we're talking with, <coughs> pardon me, we're trying to talk with Matt Colbert and David Flanagan, uh, two of the three co-founders of Misfit, an uh, agency here based locally but with clients nationally. Uh, you can get a hold of them, I haven't given this up yet, so you can get a hold of them at 916-290-9660, easy for me, there's lots of nines and twos in there, 916-290-9660 agencymisfit.com and you can email them at info at agencymisfit.com and so um, conversation at the break we were having uh, the interesting kind of to continue on is, is talking about when, when you, you say kind of interesting <laughs> sorry I know I, I, it's, it's extremely interesting <laughs> fascinating to hear more so let's go it. more that's right, let's that's go right. more let's dig deeper uh, <laughs> talk about the, the when you go through this say exercise, maybe that's not the right word, but when you go through this exercise with the client and you help them discover you know, really what it is that they're about, and then you try to get the message out. I mean, that, as you were saying, is it can be different and it can be difficult, maybe different than what other firms would do, right? Yeah, let's come in and change your colors and give you a new logo and we're done, right? And brand it on social media and move on to the next mm -hmm. one. That's not what you guys do. You guys go deeper than that. Um, so, I'm, but I'm sure there's times where, you know, it's one thing if it's an organization of 10 people, Right, that's and everyone's on board. Well, what if it's an organization of two thousand people? Mm -hmm. How do you get all two thousand on board with, with that? So, have you guys had experience with? You fire nineteen hundred ninety nine. Can you close the door? I, I, I think it, it's interesting. Matt mentioned, or, or you did, Mark, the uh, Starbucks. Kind of interesting. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. About that. And they're, uh, I read in a magazine, airline magazine, one time that their chief marketing, VP of marketing, uh, Scott Bedberry said um, that Starbucks is a company that is uh, specializes in uplifting moments for people every day. And then he goes on to say, and I didn't say coffee. No, no, yeah. And it's, it's like, wait a minute, the VP of marketing of Starbucks says basically to the public that their company is not about coffee. It's like, how do you, how do you get away with that and keep your job? And I think that that's really interesting is, is using that as an example because it applies to the 10 person firm, it applies to the 2,000, and it, I don't know how many people are in Starbucks, but it has to start from the top, but it has to reach the bottom of the company. Everybody from the person who empties the trash and answers the phone to the person at the very top on in the gleaming tower or whatever has to understand, live the brand and understand how it applies to their responsibilities. Yeah, it's really funny because what you find in best practices with these brands that just seem to get it, to have absolute clarity and with on, on who they are and, and more importantly who they're not, um, the, the common thread with all of them is that all of their employees are aligned. Um, and while they all have mission statements and vision statements and core values and all those things that we in business know are important, the truth is none of those are effective tools in managing the business day in and day out. Right. If I'm the receptionist, uh, one of our favorite clients a years ago is Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's has a very distinct tone <laughs> and personality. And of course that's felt in marketing and products. But what about how you answer the telephone? Should it be felt there? Well, absolutely. So how do I give a receptionist, possibly making minimum wage, a clear understanding of who we are and who we're not so that it impacts how, she, how he or she answers the phone? That's when a brand is done well. Yeah. We find that with, with our clients, um, clients who are willing to take that journey and, and realize that that brand clarity needs to be applied to every single touch point that they have with their audiences, those are the right fit for us. Those who think and feel that branding is just a marketing exercise that's going to live in the marketing department and that's going to help drive a campaign, but that's it, um, that's just not a good fit for us as we found. We're taken off uh, from John Wayne Airport uh, Southwest and uh, I've shared this story because I love it so much and it's a great example of somebody who really understands and lives the brand is flight attendant uh, is is um, we're taking off from John Wayne it's just a rocket ship straight up in the air and um, he takes the initiative to say because of the state of the economy and the duration of this flight I'm gonna go ahead and hand out the peanuts right now and he dumped a box of peanuts in the aisle of course, the plane is going straight up and down, <laughs> and it started raining peanuts, and people were screaming and laughing and grabbing for peanuts, and, and that that man knew the Southwest brand so well, what we call a rebel brand, um, that changes everything. He knew that brand 
so well, he incorporated it into his daily activities. Now, if, if, if he had done that with another airlines, Delta or United, or he would have gotten, yeah. oh, yeah. gotten thrown oh, out over the yeah. ocean. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But with Southwest, he, that wasn't printed in some book somewhere that, oh, you should pass out the peanuts, and then tell a joke while you're doing it. <laughs> he just knew the brand so well that he, uh, he incorporated it into his thinking and his responsibilities. And I think I would add too, I think what's really important and we can't, can't be lost in all of this is why does this matter? Um, it has a massive financial impact on the brand. Oh, if you look at Coca-Cola as an example, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, but historically as their brand is valued over the years, if, if you were to look at their total market cap valuation, um, roughly 50 to 60% of what their brand value on the open market is based on that emotional connection people have with that brand. Not their sales, not their operations, not their not accounts, anything not tangible. anything tangible, but it's the emotional connection. Um, you mentioned, David mentioned Starbucks. You know, we, we, we will ask clients, does Starbucks have the best coffee? No, no one ever says yes, although I put enough cream and sugar. Well, I put enough cream and sugar. <laughs> I love Starbucks. Yeah, I, I, I like great. their Americanos. Right? I, I like yeah. their shots better than other Well, other pro- so other do they have the cheapest coffee? No. So from a business model, if they were in the coffee business, they they would be out of business. If the biggest coffee company in the world, to David's point, has built a whole business, a very profitable business, with a premium on their product because they're about more than coffee. Yeah. And so this, this idea of brand clarity and differentiation done well has a massive financial impact for every business in every industry. Yeah. And that seems to me to be a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, maybe you guys could add some, some clarity to me on that. Um, you know, in terms of like you said, the chief marketing officer for Starbucks didn't mention coffee. Um, I, would they? Would that have been the way it was, 15, 20 years ago, or has that has it kind of evolved? I'm 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 shocked. I can't remember the gentleman's name back in the 50s. Oh, I'm killing myself because he became one of my heroes. Where he got into the psychology, the deep psychology of a brand, and the idea that each product or service has kind of an inner spirit of its of its own, and he became extremely popular, I can't remember his name now, but anyway, um, he got uh, uh, tarred and feathered and carried out of town for manipulating people and, uh, yeah. and selling people things that they didn't need, and it became, this is when advertising back in the late 50s and early 60s got a really black eye for being hucksters and, and shysters, and right. uh, uh, advertising became a dirty word. Mm-hmm. Um, in so much so that even today my, my father won't admit that I'm in advertising. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, but it, 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 it is gaining popularity of, of building brands in terms of, again, the why, or finding that spirit of a product or services that is, again, outside of the actual product or service itself. Yeah, I think that, that to your point, there's always been brands who just intuitively got it. You know, Nike launched their Just Do It campaign, I believe, 30 years ago, um, and and they just got it. They knew that at that moment they weren't about shoes; they were about the spirit of sport. Yeah. Um, you know, Apple, when Steve Jobs came back and they launched their Think Different campaign, had nothing to do with technology. He just knew they got it. Um, we're also getting into an age now, though, where the the touch points, the interactions that every brand has with their audience are so there's so much higher than ever before. It used to be TV, radio, billboard, print, and in person. With the introduction of social media and digital media and you name it, streaming, um, it's you more, it's it everywhere. is, and it's so so much more important than ever that you have absolute clarity in your brand other and, and your voice and the tone and what you say so that you're not lost in the clutter. And that it be authentic. That's, that's another thing. It's, it's, if it was just as easy as just, well, oh, just create this brand, um, and this is sexy, uh, but it isn't genuine and authentic to the company or the organization, uh, then it's destined for failure. Oh yeah, the consumer knows. Yeah, they, they pick absolutely. Up on that. Yeah. Or, you're, or you're a brand that then makes a promise that it, that's, very, that's too aspirational. Oh, we, we're not this today, but we want to be that tomorrow. So we're gonna point that, we're gonna tell everyone, this is who we are, and then what happens? You, you, you intrigue your audience, they try you, and you can't live up to it. And then back to the you know old old advice: you get one chance to make your next impression or first impression, yeah, and um, and, you, and you lose it. Yeah, that could be disastrous as exactly. as it has been. I don't know if you guys have any examples that come to mind, but I'm sure there are 
many examples throughout this American corporate history of where that's happened. And, and so, uh, so it's important, and, and it's interesting you guys had mentioned to, um, again, again, about how you have to get everyone on board. And so you had mentioned that some, some cases you have clients that, or not clients, you talk to people and if they're not able to do that, you're not gonna work with them. So let's touch on that when we get back from the break. That'd be great. You listen to me on the number or something, what if I? David Ogilvy, pardon? David Ogilvy. What about him? Is that the one you were trying to think of? No. Okay. No. He's, a um, no. he's actually older than that. He's at, right in the camp with David Ogilvy. Uh, he was a he was a, a research psychologist, and he was his discipline was psychology. And advertising grabbed him and made him rich and famous. He got a castle in New York. Went crazy, and, and uh, then was lambasted yeah. by the by the. More conservative Middle sure. America, and literally not literally, uh, real tarred and feathered. And <laughs> he wasn't and literally tarred. beaten with a stick. You know? No, he wasn't Caned. literally. He was cane. Yeah, was but he his career came crumbling down as the as the uh, as the uh, population began to suspect advertising of getting into their psyche mm -hmm. and selling them things they didn't want. Mm -hmm. But his whole bet was based on archetypes and. And that stuff, and it's like, it's like wow, he got it. He got it. He, he was very, it. you know, archetypes are a very Carl Jung kind of psychology. Right. And if I know that and I start manipulating you, you bad for me. Yes. We're back. Listen to me on the numbers. I'm on one of money one oh five five. This is your host, Mark Bellows. Tax principal with Clifton Larson Allen, CLA is a national CPA firm with offices throughout the U.S., including one in Roseville, which is where I reside. You can get a hold of me at 916-784-7800 or mark.bellows at claconnect.com. Uh, CLA, our, our little line, if you want, I don't know what to call it, tag, I can tagline is what I can think of, but that may not be it, but to know you and to help you. So, again, not, not to get your tax return correct or to, you know, because I think in our world, a lot of times, tax returns, audit review, or audit reports, that type of stuff is a commodity, really. It's uh -huh, monetized, sure. and so you have to do something more, bring something more to the table. Yeah. More than a CPA. Yeah. yeah. I like that. And it, I would tune right into that, to know you. And it's like, what's that got to do with numbers? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. And it's like, what does that interest you? Is that of importance? It's like, are you kidding me? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah, I want my CPA to know me. But don't I have to say something about numbers in my tagline? <laughs> right. Come on. No, otherwise they're going to think we're an ice cream shop or something. Well, and I think people go there, yeah. and, and I, I've, I've, sh I've heard it over the years of being in different firms and, and you know different branding things that I've been a part of or heard of. People will say that, so it's a comment like that. Like you said about Starbucks. Yeah. What about coffee? Yeah. Or their pastries or whatever. So. Yeah, that's the price of entry. You got that. Yeah. We know Starbucks sells coffee. Yeah. Right? So what else did so? So we had mentioned that this this psychologist in the fifties <coughs> tapped into it, and then and then people have rebelled, if you will, or parts of parts of America rebelled. Um, but I think it's kind of so it's been going on since then, effectively. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. I think that people got in the sixties and the seventies. People got afraid of it, and advertising and marketing became very much analytical, and, and the numbers reach and frequency and stuff like that and, and the psychology of advertising was really like yeah we don't talk about that why, why not because that's manipulation and it's like well, no it's not uh, I mean you certainly can use it to manipulate people like you can a lot of things but the psychology of advertising and branding is it's not a secret it's 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 psychology because it's real to the human individual and so can you use that for or against a person? And the answer is yes. So it just depends on what you want to do with yeah, it. And I, and I think a lot of it goes back to, I mean, I don't think it's really as, as scary or anything as it may be perceived back in the day. You know, it's really about, I mean, we all know this, people buy or or forget buy, decide to do something based on perceived benefit, mm -hmm. not on proof sure. points, right? And so we talk about connecting with someone emotionally, whether you're asking them to buy uh, pizza product A over pizza brand B, or or doing something as, as simple as buckling your seatbelt. I mean, any of it's behavior change, right? 
Um, it's about communicating them with benefits. And we talk about connecting emotionally. It's not to manipulate. It's to make sure that, that whatever's being offered or asked, um, that, that they connect with it on an emotional level that they understand the, the benefit to them of doing so. Frankly, that, that's in the organization's interest that, that's asking of that action, and it's in the audience's interest. Um, you know, obviously, what, what's intended for good can always be twisted in a different direction, but yeah, that's true. That's of exactly, and that's any relationship. I mean, all day long, the interactions we're having with people, we are trying to convince them, trying to uh, get them to think like we think, and they're doing the same thing. And that's called interaction and relationship, and, and just the whole world of sales is, is one of trying to convince another person that what you have is to their benefit. Right. Now, can you use that to try to manipulate them? Sure, and that's called lousy sales. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned the seatbelt campaign. Have you guys done types of campaigns for local or city or state governments along yeah. those kind of lines? On the seatbelt one? Yeah, I mean, over the years, both currently and with our old uh, agency, David and I have worked on, a, I don't know, I was going to say a million. That's probably an exaggeration. <laughs> but but I felt a like couple dozen uh, campaigns, <laughs> usually statewide, um, regarding that that route that they revolve around behavior change essentially um, one of one of I know my favorite and I'll let David speak to it over the years it was the seatbelt cane campaign that David and team worked on just because you, you, you hear seatbelts you think well gosh doesn't everyone wear their seatbelt yeah yeah and it is really interesting because that really was a psychological uh, approach in that we were 98 percent of Californians wore their seatbelts and we were talking to a or maybe a little less than that, but we were talking to a very small population right, right. of people who just didn't wear their seatbelts. Why not? Over and over, just telling them, wear your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt, wasn't enough. And what we found out was it was an issue, <coughs> not of rebellion, I don't want to wear my seatbelt. It was an issue of, oops, I forgot. I have a habit of sticking the key in the ignition, starting and going before I buck my seatbelt. And so it became an issue of reminding them not to wear their seatbelt because it's the law. It became an issue of reminding them to wear a seatbelt because there's other things in your life that are worth remembering, i.e. your children or your wife or, or whatever. It became a real psychological uh, uh, approach to you have to remember. Remember or be remembered was the tagline. Hmm. Um, and it actually moved the needle quite a bit, more than we had anticipated. Oh, that's great. Remember or be remembered. I like that. Remember or be remembered. Yeah, that's good. Um, so you mentioned that sometimes you'll meet with someone and then you decide it doesn't appear that they're going to want to go on board, so you will screen them out, if you will. So what's that? I mean, how does that process work? Do you initially meet with management or the board? Sure. Or? You know, ironically, it really doesn't happen that often anymore. Um, mainly in that the vast majority of our business is, knock on wood, is referral based. Um, so clients who have had their eyes open or feel like you know we've helped them transform their organization, they will constantly refer other brands to us, and, and that's just been a huge blessing. But early on, when you're starting any business, you're you know talking to a lot of potential clients, and um, in, in upon meeting with the CEO or a chief marketing officer, or depending on the size of the organization, um, you, you quickly identify you know is is this someone that's a good fit. Um, or not, and, and, and it goes both ways. It's not a, you know, we understand that the way that we see the world is um, is not the way that everyone else sees the world, right. and that's okay. Um, there, there are. No, I don't know about that. Well, you know, the, the truth is, I mean, we while we work nationally, you know, we're based here in Sacramento, um, and there are some great marketing agencies in Sacramento. We are very blessed in Sacramento to have a, a ton of great agencies, but we don't all see the world the same way. Mm -hmm. There are some that are a great fit for us, and. and and so when we identify those, the feeling's mutual, and we pour our heart into those, and they pour their heart into us. And those that aren't a great fit, um, who, who are really just, you know, we have clients that, J I just, yeah, yeah, I, I know that brand stuff, but I just need a logo. Um, <laughs> fine, like, no problem. That's not, not who you guys are. Not who we are, right. and, um, and that's where we go. Did you know that from the day you started the agency? I mean, I, I, granted, I know you have to sometimes you have to take money and to pay the bills yeah. or take the client. But I mean, was that? Do you know I that? I think from the we beginning? knew that when we started Misfit. Agreed. Uh, okay. um, if if you step back a hundred years, uh, it's taken me. I don't know about you, Matt, but it's taken me a long time to understand this world to the point where I feel confident um, in 
you know, sharing insights and opinions. Before starting out in my career, no, I was just, I was lost, completely mm -hmm. lost. And I think that's where a lot of people are out there in, in marketing is, um, as Matt mentioned, you know, you don't need a, a degree in brain surgery to get into marketing. Um, but <laughs> Literally. <laughs> you probably <Yeah>. should. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, you know, it's funny. I, I think it's one of those things that, that if I look back, even before starting Misfit, and I'm sure David did the same, on some level you've always known that this is what drove us. It's when David mentioned the story of how we got to meet each other, and mm. the truth is when the company I worked for acquired, you know, David's company, the vast majority of, of folks there um, don't see things the same way, <laughs> which, which is which is fine. It's not. It's just it's different. not wrong. It's just it's just yeah. different. Yeah. And and so maybe that's why out of the hundred and some odd people, there were only a handful of us, David and I, who, who just hit it off because we talk the same language. We, we speak the same language, and everyone else thought we were crazy, um, and and I think we are. We are. Um, <laughs> but but we've been very fortunate to because we've stayed true to who we are and what what we think what we know matters to us. There's just enough other crazy clients and brands out there who um, realize this is what they what they're looking. I for. remember, you know, this was years ago, but uh, the agency that bought ours, uh, they when we started finding out what a real brand was, not just the buzz marketing was brand, but a real brand, and you and I started getting really excited about it. We started introducing it into conversations and new business pitches, and. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the agency heads came up to me and he said, yeah, we're going after such and such a client. We're going to have a meeting this afternoon. Yeah, let's not talk about that brand stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why we're not? selling logos and brochures yeah, today. Yeah, that's yeah, right. You're, you're muddying the water. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Just need to get the URL. So let's <laughs> <Behave> yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we have been talking today with Matt Colbert and David Flanagan, both uh, co-founders along with the third, what's her name? Carol Gleason. Carol Gleason. Along with Carol Gleason, the three co-founders of Misfit, a, a brand discovery agency. I like that. I like that. Brand yeah, uh, awareness. I don't know what that is. Anyway, they're, they're firm here. <laughs> Recovery. Based, yeah. <laughs> based here in Sacramento uh, with uh, clients throughout the U.S. And so uh, if you want to get a hold of them, 916-290-9660 or agencymisfit.com is the website, and you can also email them at info at agencymisfit.com. And guys, I really want to thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate you, your, your time today. It's thank good to hear, much. learn your story, and uh, look forward to seeing more of your stuff. Thank right? you, Mark. Thank yeah. you, Mark. Appreciate it. We'll be back next week, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks. You're right. That was an hour? Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much.